Right, it should be recording now. Um, hi to everyone. I had a bet with a friend. I was like, oh, if we go look at, there's a poll. I was like, I polled all my students and I asked them, I was like, do you know, when, you know, do you want another in-person lecture? And you know, the results, they were like, oh, we really want it in week four. I was like, I don't believe them. Um, so I, I'm glad I was right. That's my, that's my plus. We've got about, you can't see, I'll turn the camera around. We've got like a good, if anyone's scared of the camera, it's pixel distance, just, just avoid. But we've got an extreme turnout, which is super exciting. Um, so somewhere in that predicted 48, which is good. I don't mind, it's less people to talk to. Um, congrats to those who are actually watching lectures on time. We've been kind of, we noticed this thing last term, which was really weird, where like, Students started to really not watch lectures in this course for the first time and they all started doing freaking terribly Really like just awful had no idea what was happening So for those who are still obviously attending live or watching the streams live or even if you're watching the recordings in a timely fashion um, I hope you know that you're immediately probably in the top half of performing students, which is good. So that's a big plus um, This is probably the last one of these we'll do until week 10 I would guess um, if attendance is low, I know the weather has an impact, right? Like I'm sure there's a bunch of people sitting at home. I look, I was sitting at home today till like 1 p.m. and I was looking outside and I was like, oh, fuck that. You know, I was like, bit rainy, bit wet. Um, so yeah, we'll probably do like the exam lecture at the end of the course in person and I'll bring like one bag of snakes for you to fight over or something. Uh, but tonight we're just kind of continuing on with what we did last night, which I'm, yesterday, yesterday afternoon, which I'm hoping all of you have seen if you haven't, you'll probably be fine anyway. Uh, but it was the first part of uh, working with HTTP servers and everything here. Uh, I might go and move that over here. Uh, and what we did yesterday, really quick recap. Obviously, if you're watching the recording, this is a waste of time. But we made a really simple express server with a few different routes on it. And we showed that if you load that up in a web browser and you access those URLs, you can get content. It was very, very straightforward in terms of what was happening there. What we're looking at tonight is actually saying, okay, that text seems interesting and cool, but how do we take that further and actually build some like um, exciting things with it? In particular, the most common thing that you would see people build with it is what we call an API of some sort, or a software that has an API maybe more specifically, right? Um, you know, because an API to software is like a door to a car or something like that. You know, you wouldn't really say, I'm going to go build a door. It's like, you're going to go build a car. It's just that car has a certain way of interacting with it. So it's really important that we actually talk about what an API is. Who's heard of an API before? Who's ever just heard the phrase muttered? Yeah? Like, does anyone have any idea, any examples of one you might have played with or used or seen before? For anyone that gives a damn? I'm not going to call out your name. Not that I know your name, but you know what I mean. Um, so... Probably some of the most common places you'll hear APIs are like really popular pieces of software, right? Like Google Docs, Google Sheets, these have APIs. A lot of Google products have APIs. Most Amazon or like Amazon AWS as a whole bunch of products has APIs. Uh, pretty much everything like what's a, what's Spotify? Does Spotify have an API? Oh, Spotify has an API. Wow. And on my LinkedIn the other day, they were like, oh, did you know that Canva has an API? Or well, they're trying to get to that point. I'm not sure if they're that joined waitlist. I think they're on the cusp of it. I think that's a team they started off there. Atlassian's probably got some series of APIs for their product. So if you're using like a piece of software like Jira or something at Atlassian, they have APIs. And then in the chat, we've got, you know, PayPal API. Okay, there's like so much stuff here, right? I'm sure pretty much any serious company you look at and you, you look up API, you'll find something like it and you'll get a lot of fairly similar you know, pieces of information. There's a product we use at work called Intercom. Intercom is a, um, I don't know if I can open it because it might open up. That's okay. Um, Intercom's like a customer messaging, emailing, live chatting software management. So it's essentially a communication platform for, you know, B2C, business to customer companies. And they have an API and their API uh, lets you do a whole bunch of things. So imagine like a live chat. You've been on a website, you've been on the Jetstar website, Qantas website, they've got a live chat. You talk to people. They've got an API here that's got a whole bunch of stuff in it that lets you kind of manipulate it. 
And we'll, we'll get back to the slides in a sec, but essentially this piece of software here, which is a live chat software, has a whole bunch of info that says, you know what, if you're a programmer, you can come in and you can actually manipulate the product if you want. For instance, like part of the product is there's a whole bunch of conversations. You can have like conversations with your customers, right? Again, like if you've been on a live chat, there are conversations. Um, and if I just go and try and look for the docs, you'll start to see um, these things are always a nightmare to navigate. Um, okay. I like scroll down and I look for conversations. Here you go. And saying that I can like, let me zoom in a bit for some people. I can create a conversation or retrieve a conversation, update one, reply to one, assign one, close a conversation, all these different things. And when I click on it, I get all this information here. I got this kind of Cody looking thing on the right here. I know that's a bit hard to see with some of the light. Um, lots of content that maybe looks a little bit like something you might have seen in iteration one with data tables and whatnot. But it's essentially at its core a, a bunch of ways that you can manipulate a piece of software that someone else has written. You know, it's a little like guideline or book. And, we can talk again about the theory of APIs, but fundamentally everything you work with in the real world kind of behaves in a similar principle. It's a bit like abstraction, right? We talk about abstraction, we talk about hiding details, we talk about black boxes already with your testing. If you write a piece of software and you kind of already have in this course and possibly like 1511 and stuff, you write it, but you have these functions that abstract it. And you've seen this in iteration one, you've got these functions like you know channels create and users register and uses login. And these are ways of people interacting with your software and they don't really know how the insides of it work, but you've kind of got this clear definition of how they can interact with it. And it's not just software, you've probably seen this in many facets of life, right? Everything you do, think about whether you're like tapping onto a bus or a train, you know you just gotta like pull the card out and tap it and it says something. You know what you have to give to it and you know what it's gonna give you back, you don't really understand how it's doing it, but you, under you understand the game you're playing, right? Same with, you know, again, driving a car. You accelerate, brake, handbrake, steering wheel, gear thingy, my bob, right? Um, these are all different ways of interacting with complex systems. Just because there's no website for how to drive a car, you could still say that a car has like some idea of an API. It's, it's that interface of interacting with it. But let's go back to the definition. I'm sorry, if I'm a bit flat tonight. I'm having some tooth pain recently and I'm on painkillers, which is fun. I say it's just ibuprofen, but it mellows my mood a bit. It's not that dramatic. Um, so an API, if we look at the definition of it, is an application programming interface, which I think is a remarkably boring phrase, and it refers to an interface exposed by a particular piece of software. Okay, so it's, it's the interface for a black box is another way to think about it, because black box is a concept we're probably all quite familiar with. Um, the most common usage of API as a term is in web-based software, uh, which really just refers to a contract that a particular service provides, the interface of the service acts as a black box, like we said, uh, and indicates that for particular endpoints or functions, right? Like think about your iteration one, there's these functions that you can use to interact with it. Um, if you give that function a particular output, you can expect a certain behavior or side effect to happen and then you'll get a particular output back. If you give the function an input, you'll get a certain output back. Um, that's it, that's all there is to it. A lot of it's just buzzwords otherwise. We talked in the last kind of half lecture about clients and servers. We talked about how like when it comes to the web, you'll have a web browser and that web browser will talk to a server and that server responds to you and you kind of have this back and forth, a conversation nearly. Um, APIs follow the exact same principle. It's, it's typically someone's computer like a browser or client is just constantly trying to talk to a server through its API, for instance. And the thing, the thing that's kind of subtle like this is, uh, if you go to say something like YouTube here, and I've got, here you go, some random political video. Um, a kind of, without going too deep into like the web architecture and the history of web here, you'll have something like my web browser tried to access that URL up the top, which is a particular resource on the web. It contacted a server, that server gave me back a document, which was this YouTube page. And that, that makes sense, we saw that with the Wikipedia example, but what's actually then going on under the hood here, which is a little bit more interesting, is that um, whilst this page has loaded, every time I kind of click or interact with it, 
it's actually also talking to YouTube servers through YouTube's own API, right? Because you can write an API for your own software. It's not like other people have to use it. Um, to do some dynamic things, like if I come down here and I click on dislike or I click on like, obviously that information has to exist outside of my computer, right? Like if you like a video, you're going to have to send some information over the internet to YouTube so that they know you've clicked something and something's happened, right? And that's all happening through, say, YouTube's API, the maybe internal API. You've got things like save here or thanks, or when you like write a comment, like, okay, you know, and you click comment and that goes to YouTube server, right? All of that's happening through some kind of like YouTube's internal API, which is a complex system um, that developers at YouTube would be talking to. So it's, it's really just sending information back. It's like calling functions on the internet is, is a very, very simple way of thinking about it. Go and, go and upvote that. Um, see how high we can get it. So conceptually, it's again one of those things, if you overthink it, it gets a bit complicated, but if you can keep it really simple and you say it's just functions on the internet and someone's defined them for me, just like you've seen with iteration one, things start to make a bit more sense. And if you haven't figured out already where we're leaning towards with this, for iteration two is that we basically take what you're doing in iteration one and instead of you writing um, instead of you writing functions uh, just in a piece of JavaScript you're actually going to be writing functions in the context of a web server so instead of just calling them and stuff with yes it'll be like well let's actually send requests over the network like we've seen with that intercom API uh, one of the most kind of standard and ubiquitous ways that APIs are written because at the end of the day uh, an API I mentioned it's like a function on the internet Well, what do you know about a function? It has a name. It has an input. It has an output, right? And maybe a description that tells you what it does When it comes to API's like intercoms API, it's really not much different. It has a Name which instead of a function name is actually typically a URL. So there's a URL there like that and we've seen this in the last code example um, here these are just URLs. They're not function names, right? They're just URLs, which are just strings that go to the end of a particular website. Um, but they also have inputs and outputs. So ones like this here, you can see it has some inputs, which is who's the message from and what's the body of the message. And then it has a response, which, you know, in real API docs is a little bit more complicated than string. But here it's saying that this will return a, a, an object of the message that was created. So it's following the exact same kind of principles that you've, come to understand when it comes to programming in general, uh, which is very helpful. It's one less thing you have to learn. But to make things a little bit more wieldy, most APIs that are all based on like HTTP, web URLs, right? They're all sending URLs like you copy and paste to your friends. Uh, they follow the RESTful, I don't know if it's a protocol, I don't know what you'd call it, RESTful um, API. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a type of API, might be the right language. Um, that was far less of an exciting rabbit hole than I thought. A RESTful API is an application program interface API that uses HTTP requests, which pretty much every API uses, um, to get, put, post, and delete data. So what this is saying is that if you write an API for a piece of software, pretty much everything you do can be broken up into four fundamental operations, which is to either read something, like read, you know, get information, read only, to create new information, to update information that already exists, or to delete information that exists. And everything can be broken up into one of those four categories. Um, and when they design APIs, they design it based on that as well. And you can start to see this if I look at this one here. You can see we've got something here that says post. And what do we know that post means? Well, post meant create. So it's a way of creating something. Uh, if we come to retrieve a conversation, you'll see here that it will say, it'll give the URL, which is, you know, the function name. It isn't actually listed here, but this one is a get. Uh, and then sometimes it really depends on how an API is written. This one, I'm getting a feeling. Yeah, so there's like a delete one to actually delete something. And there's nothing in inherently interesting about these. Like there's nothing special in, you know, software that, makes this unique. It's just a convention, another way to communicate. So the APIs we're going to be looking at in this course and the most common type you'll see on the internet will be RESTful APIs that are just URLs, function names, inputs, outputs, descriptions of what happens, um, and a particular 
method here, we call it. Now, we also refer to these four operations as CRUD operations, C-R-U-D, and that's because of the create, read, update, and delete. Um, I don't hear them refer to too often as that colloquially, but generally it's just RESTful, post, put, delete, um, get. And we can actually see this with a bit of code. So if, I, if we look at some code, what we had here was really quite simple. It was like, well, let's just have a few URLs that you can get. But if I go and open up um, this next example, there's a couple of concepts to introduce here. And the first concept is the idea of um, not just using .get for things. So the previous example we had, everything was just .get. We just had a .get, .get, .get. So everything was just a get, which is like the kind of standard, most basic uh, HTTP RESTful method. Nothing too exciting about it, but now we're playing around with one that is .get and .post as well. Everything else is pretty similar. We have two URLs, one of them is slash apple, the other one is slash orange, so just slightly different, different names. Um, and what you can also see here is that we're starting to take in information, we're starting to get like function parameters in, so a ways to capture input, uh, and we're also doing some kind of funky stuff with JSON here. Uh, we so talked about JSON last week, and there's a, there is just genuinely a few concepts to unpack. But let's unpack them together. So, if I run this server, 4.2 crud, um, and I go and open up a web browser, this is running on, like we saw yesterday, localhost port 3001. I know it's running on port 3001 because I specified it in my code. It can be any port I want. Uh, and when I run that, it says cannot get slash. That makes sense because if I look at my server, we didn't define what like the base slash URL was. We only defined what slash apple would be or what slash orange would be. So then if I come here and I go slash apple, um, I get this kind of funny response here. And if you look at this name that we try and capture, we'll kind of loop back to that in a second because it might be a tiny bit confusing. Just going to really quickly check the uh, stream. Cool. Um, yep, that name bit for a second. Let's actually focus now on this bit. So we know that in the previous example that, goodness, that we just said response.send hello world. So response is just an object. It's how Express is built. Don't overthink it. It's, it's a way of just sending information back to whoever called you. And in the previous one, we just sent a string back. It wasn't too fancy. In this case, instead of sending a string back, well, we are sending a string back in this case, but the string we're sending back is actually a JSON string that we've taken an object and turned it into a JSON string. So that object is really just an object with one key in it, which is message. So just a simple JavaScript object, one key, which is message. That key is a, has a value of a string. And we're taking that object, um, JSONifying it into a string and returning that string instead. So this web page here still has a string that is returned to it. That part should make sense. If I got rid of this name here, I would hope that um, I would hope that this wouldn't be too complicated an idea right here. You know, it's like the other example. It's just that instead of sending back a string, we're sending back a JSONified object. Are there any questions about that? That's a good question. So if we send, if we're always sending back to web pages is just kind of like strings without a structure, um, the web browser or the software on the web browser doesn't know how to maybe deal with it at scale because it's just like a whole bunch of strings. So if we package it up into JSON, we can create all these kinds of complex structures and send it back. That's a great question um, that motivates the example much better. And we'll see this as we kind of do some testing as well. But it's all well and good to send back JSON. That shows us that we can send back some more interesting outputs to the function, like more interesting return values. Um, but getting input values is a bit more interesting as well because we don't really have a function that we're calling, right? Like it's not like normal code where you just type in a function call and you give it some inputs with commas in between it. Um, different HTTP routes have different ways of accepting these like function arguments. And in the case of get requests, 
they're actually done through the URL. So what I mean by that is that if we want to send data to the server when we make this request, we actually send it through the URL with this pattern, which is that after the URL we put a question mark, and then we essentially do like key value pairs with like the key equals a value. So in this case, I might say name equals Hayden. And we can send more parameters that way by, you know, putting an ampersand between all subsequent key value pairs and saying, you know, age equals five and then saying like height equals 10, something like that. So that's how information is kind of sent in that function call that is, you know, HTTP requests, um, specifically for get requests. And you can see that the way Express has been designed is that everything that you send through that URL, it actually captures for you in this request.query object that it packages for you. So Express does a lot of the work here. And you can see that if I was to just console log, for instance, now remember console log will print it to the terminal, not the web page. If I was to just console log request.query here and then restart the server, you will see on the terminal that it will show up, bring up that object. So Express kind of decodes that, captures it from the URL, turns it into an object. You can just take it from that object, do something with it if you want. We could, we could kind of manipulate this route if we really wanted to. And instead of saying, um, you know, printing someone's name, we could call it uh, slash add. And we could capture a number, or like two numbers. Call it number one, and we could capture like number two. Uh, we could just add them together. And we could say like, the sum is num1 plus num2, like this. Now we might run into some problems in this case um, when it comes to typing, but we'll see that in a second. So we've got our num1 plus num2. Um, you can see already that TypeScript, this is one of the advantages of TypeScript. It's kind of getting a bit worried here because in the world of um, web servers, all the information you get from a URL is always a string. Even if you're putting numbers in there, it's like characters, you know, everything is just string data. And if you want to use it as non-string data, you essentially have to convert it in some way yourself. So what TypeScript is picking up on here is it's like, hey, the query arguments number one and number two, they're going to be a string, but you've just tried to add them together and um, not good necessarily. So I, I actually, it's kind of encouraging me to convert them to a number. In uh, JavaScript, if you know that a string is, is basically a number or could be converted to a number, you can use the parse int function. It's just built into JavaScript and it just converts a string. Um, or hopefully, it, let's see what it wants. Sometimes it might not be happy. Argument type string is not, oh, I don't know. Let's see how it goes. But you could, in this, is, in this case here, you would be converting it to a number. This is also where you start to run into some weird TypeScript errors, argument type string, parse questions, list of strings is not assignable to parameter of type string. And this is also where we get into some potentially weird type coercions in TypeScript, which don't come up much. It, you'll occasionally get the uh, odd annoying TypeScript quirk. One thing you can do in TypeScript is called like, uh, I think it's called type coercion, I'm not too sure, where you essentially say, well, the express server's got this really weird thing where it's like the query's either going to be a string or some random object called parsed questions or it's a string array or it's an array of parsed questions but as the developer of this software i know that it's always just going to be a simple string so i can just kind of you know convince typescript and say it's all right relax this is always going to be a string so therefore you can treat it as a string and therefore it stays like that um, and now when we run it it should behave And I'll have to change what we pass in through the URL, right? Because our program's changed. It doesn't expect a name or age or height or whatever. And I can say number one equals three and number two equals five. And then I get, change the apple, right? I changed the name of the function, right? So it went from apple to add uh, and then it says the sum is eight. Okay, so same principle, just functions on the internet. Um, and I'm just pulling that data out of the URL. Now, one, it, I mean, if you just stop there and you were just making get requests, it would all be pretty straightforward at this point. You'd be like, okay, it's just different ways of calling a function. 
Where things get a bit more interesting though when it comes to HTTP requests is that web browsers are actually just designed in terms of how you use them as a standard user to uh, take in get requests. So when you type in a URL like the one we have there and you send it to a server, it's always being sent as a get request. It's just how browsers are designed. It doesn't send it as a post request or a put request or a delete request because typical users like us, they just don't expect us to be like trying to manipulate things straight from the URL, right? They're just like, well, you're just giving us a URL, we'll give you a page back. Actual programmers like us can go and build websites that those websites themselves are sending lots of these, you know, modifying API calls under the hood, but just as a browser user, it's all get requests. So if we want to make a post request here, we can't really just type in, um, say, open a new tab, localhost 3001 slash orange, um, because you can see already the web browser just tried to send a request to that URL on that server of a type get, and the server basically said, sorry, that doesn't exist, because the slash orange route exists, but there's no like get version of it. There's only the post version of it. The post version being the one to create something. Now obviously this function down here doesn't actually create anything in this case. That's what I mean about the get post put delete is not some law of physics. It's just documentation in a way. And if you were a programmer, that would be bad, naughty kind of thing. You know, it's like, well, it shouldn't be called post if it, does not, if it doesn't create anything. That's just a poorly written API in this case. The, the example is just meant to be a little bit more straightforward. So if we would like to actually um, interact with that, we need to use something that's called an API client. And I might have jumped a little bit ahead in the slides here. Um, yeah, so there's a few different ways that we can talk to a web server. Uh, the second one is a web browser. That's the one you're familiar with. The first one is an API client, and the third one we'll get to later. But let's look at the API client. So an API client is really just a piece of software that is designed to send requests to API servers. It's not like a web browser. It's written for developers. Um, there are a few that you can use. A really common one is Postman. I think Postman's a little bit kind of big and complex for what we do sometimes. At work, I use an API client called Insomnia. Um, though generally with our students, we encourage them just to use one that's called ARC client because it's, it's just kind of lightweight. And I definitely had some trouble installing it last term because I forgot how to. Um, but if you just ARC client, Google Chrome add on, I feel like it said it was deprecated. Okay, so I've installed it just from the Chrome store. So if you're using Google Chrome or like in this case, Chromium on the CSE machine, you can essentially just go here and add it on or, or launch it. Uh, this is where like Chrome apps are really just, they're just pieces of software that are written within the Chrome environment. Um, and I'm just gonna, you can see a bunch of this is kind of from last term here. If I just somehow delete it doesn't matter, I don't need to delete anything. Uh, but let's kind of play around with it. So if we pop back up our code, and we know our server's still running, so just like in a web browser here, I can say, well, actually, I'm going to, you know, uh, number one equals five, and number two equals six, so that the server should respond to me with, um, should respond to me with 11, right? That's how math works, I think. The sum is 11. Okay, so we've kind of tested that that works, and now if we want to call the orange one, what we do is we come back up here and we change the method from get to post and instead we have orange but this is kind of where things get a little bit more interesting when you're sending post requests you don't actually send information via the URL like we do with get requests you send it through something called the body and the body isn't too complicated it's, it's essentially just a, a little payload that comes along with these requests because you know network requests are very complicated it's not just the URL it's got all the the content inside of it too. So we can actually add information to the body if we'd like to, um, just by, oh. we can try it out here. Let's try putting JSON here, because that's how our program's written. Um, name is Hayden, like this, and let's send that. And we get an error, because I've probably done it wrong. Unexpected token, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's actually have a look at what Orange is doing here. So Orange is, Unlike the add one, it is expecting 
that we get the data from request.body instead of request.query. And we're assuming that it's going to be some kind of JSON object, which is why we're trying to turn the raw JSON string that it gets and decode it into something um, JavaScripty, right? It's the opposite of stringifying something with JSON. And that gives us our body, and then we're going to grab the name out of that object. So, you know, we've, we've kind of sent that object through in string form with JSON, and then we unpack it. But something's going wrong here, so what we're going to do is we're going to console log request.body, and we're going to see what actually happens, because we're getting this 500 error. So I run the server again, and I will run this again, and it says 500 error. I come back here, and you can see here that um, this looks totally empty. So essentially this is like, hey, I'm not actually sending anything through to the server. It's like, oh, okay, that's not good. There's a few little things we have to do here to get it working right, which we'll play around with in a sec. Yep, oh, sorry, I thought you were asking a question, my bad. Um, and we'll play around with the API client more, but as you can see already, it's not really a web browser. It's not really there for viewing web pages. It's there for calling functions on the internet with inputs and outputs. You're used to a, a web browser and then um, we will be talking about a request library after. But let's jump back to what we've seen uh, on the previous slides with this CRUD example. Right, we kind of jumped ahead to some ways to manage it. This is the code we were working with, with the get and the post request, which we're going to keep working with. Um, but just to summarize now, as confusing it as it is, how a typical API works is that if you are using a get or a delete request, you will send the information via the URL, typically with that kind of question mark, key equals pair, and key equals pair, and key equals pair. That's how that information is passed through. If you are sending a put or post request, which is the update or the create request, you are sending your information that you want the server to hear about in the body as a JSONified string. So you're kind of, as, as a client, sending it to the server as a JSON string. Um, and the server will basically always respond to you by packing, packing up the content as JSON and giving it back to you. So the return is always JSON. How it comes to the server depends on whether it's get delete or whether it's put post. That's an important distinction that you kind of see through the examples. One thing that's the case though, in the, in the, in the code we have here, what you would have noticed is that we've got all these like json.parses and json.stringifies and stuff. And the people who write the express library, they kind of figured out, as you do many library writers, that let's just say, and this is a number I pulled out of thin air, 90% of the people using express were just sending json back and forth, right? It's like how people were writing APIs, because that's how nearly every API is written. So they said, well, let's just cut out a lot of the boilerplate so they don't need to do all this json stringify and json parse stuff. And they develop some fairly simple code changes we can do, which are highlighted here, uh, which is that this magical line I mentioned in the last lecture on like line six here, this app.useExpress.txt, it currently says in our code, which essentially just says like the web server is going to receive and send ASCII characters. Pretty standard, like nothing too exciting. But now it's like actually, it's like a JSON-based server. So we just want you to kind of use the, the JSON rules to deal with inputs and outputs. Um, and then the, the couple other changes you'll see are that when we return something, instead of saying response.send, there's actually another function on the response object called .json, which is saying send JSON, so we don't need to stringify it. Uh, and then also with this extra line up here, converting that to JSON, we don't need to do any of this JSON.parse stuff. Because the JSON that we send to the body of post and put requests, it will just automatically decode for us. Like, you know, so it's just, it's just Express being like, everyone's doing this, I might as well do it for you. So we could go and make those changes to our code, change this from express.txt to express.json. We could kind of get rid of this because you know, it's going to do it for us. We just need to give it the object. So we'll just say, yep, yeah, response.json here. We'll do the same thing down here. And we don't need to do this part either because it should already decode the body for us from JSON to a JavaScript object. So let's see how that goes. This is probably also gonna fix our problem. Okay, so we've got that listing on port. I'm just gonna make this a tiny bit smaller. Nope, still empty. 
We're probably sending it a little bit weird. You can see there, it's, oh, now it's not actually crashing, which is a little bit different. It says, hi, undefined, thanks for sending orange. Okay, sure. But you'll see the code is much simpler. And if we do go find the previous request that we sent, oh, why is that so ugly? Um, the add, this one also works totally fine here. The sum is 11. So Express has these nice ways to just make our code a little bit easier to read. Um, I think one thing that might be, oh, I was sorry, I'm mental blanking for a second here. There's always one thing I forget, and I'm just going to see if someone's jumped me onto it already. No, you're all boring. Um, sometimes uh, there's... Sometimes there's some, no, well, that's not what I wanted. Content, con, content type, content type. Uh, that's the wrong URL, my bad. I, I, I went to change to the URL and I ended up changing um, the route from post to, or get to post. Nope, that's not it. Body. Body content type, JSON, oh, that's probably what it was. Okay, there you go. Now, there's a little bit of fiddling with this, and like, you know, web servers are kind of complicated because you could, you could teach a whole course on it, right? Like, you could teach many courses. It's an entire subset of the industry. And um, we obviously want to teach you enough to, like, you, we don't want to avoid it because it's a really fun way to work on a project, right? And it teaches you some really useful tools and skills that you'll be able to translate for, you know, years to come. Um, but we do have to kind of gloss over a few things, which I know is a little bit annoying, like when I'm playing around with these inputs and you're like, oh, that sounds like a few things I could get wrong, right? Um, but most things are pretty prescribed, which makes it quite easy. But you can see here that everything here is just a get or delete request or a post put request. And they all follow the same principle, which is that a get request just sends data through... Did I do it again? I think I did it again. I need to change this. A get request sends data through the URL, and it gets data back as a JSON object like this. And a post or put request sends data through a body, which is a JSON body, and it gets data back as JSON as well. So that's that Hayden here got captured and returned there. Now, obviously, you don't need to write code so prescriptively. You could shorten this whole thing down and just say, well, request.body.name, right? Like most of this code is irrelevant. Because request of body is where all the, the content was that was passed in. Name was just one of the keys on it. Like name is us. Request of body is part of Express, but name is what, what we defined with it. So that's the core of writing an Express server. Uh, it's a lot of just what you might call boilerplate. Um, yeah. And every other example, put requests, delete requests, they're just this, but more of the same, more parameters, more complex return types, more routes, but all the same fundamental things. Are there any questions about this so far um, before we, we will do this quick example and then move on to actually the third type of interaction with a web server? Somehow even quieter in person when I ask that question than online. Um, so no HTML and CSS, no, no HTML and CSS, uh, just what we've been doing today. This particular question, create a web server that uses CRUD to allow you to create, update and delete a point by HTTP requests. Use a global variable to manage the state. The reason we want to go through this example is because the stuff we've looked at so far kind of looks at this a little bit in a vacuum. But when you go to do this in iteration two next week, or when you go and play around with it in your labs, you're not often just going to have these routes that operate in a vacuum. They're typically going to be modifying some kind of shared data, like your data store in iteration one. So what that means is that if you wanted to, say, uh, create a little server that stored a uh, point, like an X and Y coordinate that you could update, but then you could also read it, we could simply make a very simple server that says there's going to be an x-coordinate that's null, there's going to be a y-coordinate that's null. We're going to create a, or a get route called coord. And all this is going to do, it's going to be a very simple route. 
um, it is simply going to return me the x and the y coordinate. Right, just the global variables. Just sends that back. So it's going to send null right now if I called it. If I call coord, it's just going to be like, yep, I'm sending you back a JSON object which just has x as null and y as null. And then I might create another one over here which is also called coord, which is actually really interesting. It's something that always trips students up in the exam. But um, routes don't actually have to have unique names, but you can't have the same name and method combination. So in this case, they're different routes because one's called coord, but it's a get request. One's called coord, but it's a post request. So let's say I make another one called co like coord for coordinate. Um, and what I'm going to do is to set the coordinates, I always need to capture it. And what do I know about post requests? Well, post requests, um, in fact, maybe let's make it a put request because I'm not really creating a point. I'm like updating a point that just happens to be null. And again, this doesn't matter. This is just convention to communicate to people using your API how it, how it behaves. Uh, I can say, well, um, let's let x, the global variable, equal request.body.x, and we'll let y equals request.body.y. And I don't really need this route to return anything necessarily. I could maybe have it return the things it gives me just for people to sanity check, but let's say we don't know, need to worry about that. So I might just have it return an empty object. Most routes need to return something. Everyone's expecting something back. Maybe it's an object that just says success is true. Maybe it's an empty string. Maybe in this case it's an empty object. That's a lot of what we do with your um, iteration one, right? Like you've got routes in your iteration one that just like um, log out. You log out and you don't, is there log out in iteration one? Okay, there's log out in iteration two. Bad example. There is a route in iteration one that doesn't return anything, right? Just returns an empty object. Yeah, clear, yeah, clear v1, brilliant. Uh, so much fun you're all having, clearly. Um, so we've got something like that, and now we can work with it. Now I, I'll restart this, and I can simply come back up here, and I can say, well, let's go and get our get coordinate, like this. I'm going to click send. I get back uh, x is null, y is null. I then want to go and manipulate it. I don't know, just pick another one. Um, it's a post request now where I'm going to send it uh, a couple of parameters, which is that say x is 2 and y is 3. I'm going to send that and I should get an empty object back. 404 not found. Oh no, why is that? Oh, it's a put, not a post. See? And I click send and I should get OK. I get the empty object back at the bottom there. That's good. And if I go back now to my get request, which I had at the start, my get coord, what in the world? My get coord there, you'll see that now when I call that, it's actually um, being returned. Yeah. Uh, what difference does it make if you use post request Nothing. Yeah. Not, yeah, it's, pu it's purely like um, it's language. That's it. Okay. So like, um, and you kind of see this, it's, it's all communicating to someone easily what genre of request this is. So like it's literally just for developers to be like, oh put, okay, it's clearly not creating stuff. I'm just updating something that exists. It gets really complicated actually because like you can take it very literally and like most APIs out there, every time you call it, it will actually log something like, like on, a, on a server log, which is technically like creating something. So it's like should every route be a post? even when you're reading something. Like if you read something and there's like a log of you reading it, like did you create something? So you can get very like, you can get philosophical about it if you want to, but like fundamentally it's just a, a way of just articulating yourself at a light level. Um, I definitely have worked with some companies that are like really lazy and they just make all their, everything a post request. And you just, it's, but you know, it's just language at the end of the day. It's a good question as well. But you can see there that what I've got is, you know, I, I, I tried to get my coordinates, they were null, I updated them with a put request, I tried to get them again and they weren't null, and the server's kind of storing this notion of state, but when the server restarts, I'm going to close it and reopen it again, the data's kind of gone because it was just sitting in memory, right? Like when you run a program, your variables get populated with some values because you populate them, but when your program finishes, it's not like those variables exist anymore, the variables are done with. So... Your server that you run, and again, you'll see this next week for iteration two or your, or your lab five, it will have a notion of 
data or like what's stored in it, um, but it will only really exist for the lifetime of your server running. And there's ways around that that we kind of talk about next week as well. But um, that's the gist of it. That's kind of, that ties off the end of like writing simple web servers. And it's, I didn't even really add much. I just added a global variable to, to an example there just to show you that all these routes can kind of be interconnected. And this is just like your iteration one again, right? Because in iteration one, you've got your functions, your login and register and channels create, and all of them are just operating off like a common data store. So exactly the same thing. Um, that's it before we talk about the request library, which is, which is not going to take forever. Um, so let's actually just take a short break now, probably, is a logical time to do it. And then we'll keep talking about this. Would be good. Just like three or four minutes. Everyone's really G'd up, so we'll keep going. Amazing.
OK, so we kind of had a look at this. Uh, we had this API client, which seemed really useful, right? It's pretty simple. The ARC client's a really easy, dumb one. You can't do anything super crazy with it, but it gets the job done, which is really useful. The problem with it, though, is that we kind of, um, if you remember back to the dynamic verification lecture in week two, I had said to you that using console logs or print statements to test isn't really testing, it's debugging, right? Because you can't scale it. You can't write 100 console log tests and systematically figure it out. And the exact same thing is true for using an API client to play with your server. You could argue what we just did then was testing it where we made a request and made another request and made another request and we looked at the input, but it's, it's just debugging again. It's just a way of fiddling around with it. But um, a scalable way is to deal with it programmatically, just like we made that transition with Jest. And to deal with it programmatically, we can use an NPM library to actually write code to send these HTTP requests, not have to kind of you know, put it in this nice little GUI. Um, and the library that we want you to use for the course, there's a, there's a few reasons why we want you to use this library. It's not very popular, but it avoids some problems that come with like larger scale JavaScript. It's a library called sync requests. And you know, you can Google this library pretty easily, sync request npm, sync request. Maybe I added the S myself. I mean, it's pretty popular. Like 500,000 people downloading it a week, right? That's pretty popular, but um, it's, not as, it's nowhere near as popular as some of, the big, some of the bigger ones. But if you look at the code here, it essentially just allows you to import the library. This is a slightly different syntax. I'll show you the way we use it. Um, it allows you to make a request and allows you to get the response from that request, right? It's remarkably straightforward in that, in that way. And if you look at the code example that we have here, you'll see that exact same thing where this piece of code, 4.2 requests, I'm gonna have to undo the, I'm gonna have to undo what we did. Oh no, I can't. Ooh. This kind of relies on the Apple example. So let me just go and steal that from here. Oh Lord. Sometimes pasting doesn't work very well for reasons I don't understand. Hello. I used to be really mean. When people used to walk into lectures, I used to just be quiet for a while just to like play games. I wouldn't do that to you. No, no, it's all good. Man, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if I told you this story last time, whether it was last time, but there used to be this like professor in math called Peter Brown and he used to just like if people stood up and walked out in the middle of the lecture he just like stopped talking and stare at them until they left and it was like so horrifying. It was like a real like 1990s you know like image of like you know old school universities. Um, okay this seems good it pasted twice. Sometimes there's some really weird things that happen trying to like copy from local computer to VLAB but looks like we've got our file there it looks like it's behaving exactly where we left it. Cool. Um, and then if we go back to our request one, we've got this really simple file here where we're importing a request from sync request library. Then we are making a request, which is a get request to this URL. And we're, we're putting the data that we want to send to it here, name equals Hayden. And then we're going to console log. And this, this last line's a little bit complicated here. We get the body from the request. Then we have to convert it to a string because of how the library works. It does some weird things with buffers that we don't really care about. But we have to convert it to a string. And then that string is going to be a JSON string because everything the server gives us back is JSON. So we need to like decode that from JSON ourselves. And then we're going to console log that object that we get. Now, thankfully, you can kind of copy and paste this for everything. Or you can just make a helper function and stuff. It's not, it's not too hard. But if we pull up this 4.2 request. Oops. 4.2 requests, um, we can just run this. So, but you have to run your server first, right? So my server has to be running. I can't just run the test. The server has to run over here. And then in a separate terminal, I'm going to run, you know, npm run ts node source slash 4.2 requests dot ts. And that will run the code by basically talking to the server over here. You didn't really see it, but like that terminal made a network request to the computer. And that computer's listening for a particular, you know, port and data 
from this piece of software on the, the left that we're running. You know? So every time I run that, it's actually like talking to it. And I can show you. Let's just put a console log in our server um, for Apple. Um, oh, hi. You know? There you go. So now when we run this, if I restart, I do have to restart it. Now you see that it will console log it because it's actually that function is actually being called every time I test it. So this is useful because we can write code to play with our servers now. So this is our server. Again, recap over here. It's listening for the Apple route and it's listening for the Orange route. And then separately over here are our tests. So think, think back to iteration one. You've got your like implementation, you've got your tests. It's a very similar thing. Our tests here are calling that. And you know, we could do more, we could write more. Uh, code if we want that calls more routes or anything like that. Um, how do we do body requests? But sorry, how do we do post and put requests? Because we learned before that get and delete, like all requests get everything back as JSON. But put and post don't send the data via the URL, they send it through the body. So then you think, oh, I'm not too sure. Well, you can go, it's a bit weird. Um, you can go to the library again and have a look. So just literally on the page for a second, I can see here that for a post request, I write post and then I give it the URL, but instead of putting the data with the question mark and stuff, I just give it this little object afterwards as the third argument, which has JSON, and then I just give it an object. And it's clear that, it's clear that that's gonna go and convert something to JSON for me. And that's really helpful and powerful because now I can just come over here. Maybe I can copy and paste that. I make it a post request. We know that the other route's called orange because we had our get route, which was Apple, which took in things via the query. And then we had our post route, which was orange, which took in things via the body. And what the documentation said was, I just need to give it a third argument that has a key called JSON, where I give it the object that I want it to send, which in this case is just my name in here. So those, those two, like, these are the two examples of how, like the top one is how I communicate with a, a get delete request. And then the bottom one, it's like how I communicate with like a post put request there. So similarly, um, I don't need to restart my server because the server hasn't changed. I've just changed like my, my tests in a way. The code that, um, you know, whoop, I use the same variable twice, call it response one. Okay, so there it, uh, it worked the same. It's not super obvious there, but one of those was calling the Apple route, the other one was calling the orange route. Cool. Uh, that's all well and good, but naturally we need scale. Like I said that this was like the jest of week two, but that's like the half jest of week two. To actually use it like the jest of week two, we need to use jest, you know? So I've got a file here. I don't know what it's called because the, the slide is too big. Um, but we can wrap it in jest and thankfully it's not too hard. Like if you actually like take a moment with this code. Couple things about this code. This code's a little bit deceiving. Let me just find it up in, up in the terminal here. Uh, 4.2. Request.test. Okay, couple of things about this piece of code. Firstly, before you saw me do something like say put name equals Hayden in the URL there, you can do that, that's perfectly fine, but you can see there's actually an alternative way which is to, um, instead of putting it manually there, you can actually, like we did with JSON, give it a third argument, except it takes in this QS parameter. QS stands for query string. Query string is the term we give the data that comes after the question mark in the URL. And then we just give it that object too. This is really nice to like deal with things programmatically because now we're not having to kind of like shove strings together with equal signs. We can just give it an object with information. And this is also good because whether it's QS or JSON, it's like, it, it's all the same. Like in this example, we would just use JSON. So nice, easy way to standardize things. Um, we're still returning things identically. And maybe let's just focus on this top example for a second. So this here is pretty much the same as the previous example we could have essentially copy and pasted that in. So no new ideas there. All we've decided to do is wrap it in a jest structure, which is that outer describe, test apple, and then that test slightly inside, which is just like your iteration one, just like your labs, not that complicated. And then when our actual uh, sync request library 
calls that route, we know it gives us back a string. We know that because we printed it out on the terminal before, right? Like right here. And what we actually then do is we use jest to just test if that string is what we expect. So rather than have to manually inspect it on the command line here by saying, what's the message? Well, it's hi Hayden, comma, thanks for sending Apple. I can just say, well, I expect that the body object dot message, and that's because this is the body object, right? This whole thing here. So the message key of that is just that string. It's just JavaScript objects. I expect that to be hi Hayden, thanks for sending me Apple. So now I'm relying on Jess to actually do this test for me. I don't have to visually inspect anything because you know how Jess works. If you pass all the tests, it just says you pass all the tests. Um, the bottom example, I might go and update these lecture slides a bit. I'm not sure yet, but this one looks a bit more complicated than it is um, because I've, I've got an alternative, I've got like the old school way of actually sending JSON here. So the shortcut way we saw before was here where I just said, okay, post to this URL and then here's an object with a JSON object with the object I want to send. Whereas with, if you don't use that JSON string, the kind of old way you do it is you'd actually send a body which would, you'd have to explicitly JSONify the object into a string and then you'd actually have to add some headers to your request which is another HTTP concept we're not going to go into um, at this point where you'd be like the content type is application slash JSON. There's just like more to it. So like the shorthand way of doing this is instead of having that body, if you just put JSON here, you don't have to stringify it. Amazing. And you don't need that header and it's just nice and simple like we saw in the other example. So these two things are exactly the same now. And similarly, you can parse out the, the body and you can test if it works. And now you've got yourself a little jest file so that whilst your server is running here, I can come along and say npm run jest on source slash 4.2 request dot obviously I, I don't have to specify the file if I want it to run it on all the test files just like you've done with iteration one I run it like that and then it should run jest and in theory it should pass both maybe there you go so we pass both and it's like cool now we, we're just combining this fairly simple idea of how to interact with a web server with what we already know about Jest, and now we've got a Jest scalable way of interacting with a web server. This is about the moment where your head is probably the closest to exploding, just in case you're worrying. And if your head's not exploding, then like hell, you are in a great spot. You have nothing to fear, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, week three we were like, here's a bit of TypeScript, here's some linting. Week four we were like, functions, HTTP now, it's like quite a few concepts to take in quite quickly. And um, I just, I keep reiterating this because the course doesn't kind of have this endless spiraling of ideas. Um, things just start to be a bit more like tame after this week. So um, if you feel like it's a little bit ahead of you, that's fine. You've got plenty of time to catch up. Because uh, we've, we've now covered pretty much essentially, but maybe a couple of very minor things, um, everything you need to know to do all your work till the end of week seven for like the project and stuff, right? Which is like weeks. So that's cool. Um, just for fun, let's play around a bit to maybe make your life a little bit easier. Okay, and what I mean by that as well, if most of what you're doing um, is just these two requests in Jest, well, save yourself all the boilerplate and start trying to think, you know, I'm a good software engineer who doesn't like to repeat things and start writing your own functions. And I'm going to use the, the newer function syntax we saw before. Let's just say, let's create a, a function called get request. And what it's going to take in is it's going to take in a, um, a URL, which is a string, right? And it's going to take in uh, data, which is any, because I have no idea what type that would is. Let's come back to that later, right? That's a great use of any. So now here's my function body, and I'm just going to go and copy and paste this whole thing here. And we're going to rip this apart. So I paste that in there. Cool. Um, const response equals the request of get. Okay, that makes sense. I don't want this here because I want to replace this with the URL of the parameter I pass in. I'm, I'm now trying to take my code and make it reusable. So I can use this many times and don't have to copy and paste it. And then there's a query string here, but I don't want to pass in this object with name. I want to pass in, I just want to give it data, which is whatever this function takes in. 
And then this whole, you know, get the body, string it, JSON, parse it, that's all the same as normal. So now I can just go and return it. Return body object like that. So you can see I've taken this code that's like just quite, like we've had to repeat this code a lot and we would repeat it in many cases. And now when it comes down here for this particular test, I can simply write const body object equals get request. And I can maybe just give it this URL here like that and this object here as well like that. And now that's much, much simpler code. So let's imagine you're, and you've seen this before, imagine you're writing like 100 tests, 10 tests, 20 tests or something. It's like, cool, you can write a lot of get requests now without having to include all this BS and other stuff. And similarly, you could do a post request. So let's do one for a post request. Well, what's a post request? Well, what's the difference? Well, it's got, um, instead of get, it's post, and instead of QS, it's body. That's the only difference when you make a uh, body, JSON. Yeah, JSON like that. So that's the only difference between the two. So it's like, okay, well, that's cool, because now I can come down here and, again, simplify this code. I can say post request with this URL, um, and this is the body that it takes in, like that. And delete all of that. And then here I can just say const body object equals that post request. Pretty relaxing, great. Let's try and run that. Obviously this hasn't shortened the code now, but that's only because we've only made one get request and one post request. If we're gonna make a lot more, it's gonna be a lot better. For example, let's imagine I wanted to write another test that passes in a different name, which wouldn't be a very good test because like, just writing tests where you copy and paste it, but you're testing nothing new, it just changes some strings. Like, and you don't expect there to be any edge cases. Like if I change this one to Jack or to um, Davina, or something like that's not a great test because you know why would it fail on Davina and not Hayden you know like there's nothing to it there's nothing for you to assume the system would would break under those conditions this is great because now I haven't had to write as much code to simply add more tests and this should now pass three things unless I wrote okay now it passes three things but again let's think back to lecture 4.1 where we talked about advanced functions well, what did we learn in that lecture? We learned that if we have two functions that are awfully similar to each other, maybe we can find ways to collapse them down or condense them. You know, how can I avoid writing out all this stuff again? You know, what, what would I change? There's the obvious one, which is the get in the post, right? I could say, well, how do I, um, like, let's imagine I just had get in post. I could come along and I could try and do my higher order function thing we talked about yesterday where I say like create, um, create request and you know this takes in um, a method which is either get or post or something. And this is like, remember I mentioned those mini function, this is getting a little bit heady now. So if you check out a bit, that's, that's okay. Don't beat yourself up too much. But I'm now inside of this going to create a function on the fly and return it. So I'll be like, um, you know, const my new function equals this. That indentation was not very helpful. And I'm just going to return my new function. So this is that higher order, I keep saying higher order, higher order component, but it's a higher order function in this case where my create request is simply creating a function and returning it, except that instead of putting get here, it's just going to put the method there. So this would work really well if then I wanted to say create this like get post request thing, instead of having to write out those two big blocks of code, I could just literally write out um, const get request. The function is the result of creating a get request and then I could do the same thing for post. Yeah, e exactly right. And this is where sometimes, and this is like, thank you for being so like alert with it, it's like, this is where you run into limitations with this sometimes because you might be doing this and you think, oh, that was really easy, but then you think, oh, it's not QS, it's JSON. And then you start having to complicate things is the problem. Now you start going, well, damn, I, you can't, I can't really just put a variable there, you know? Like I can't just be up here and be like, well, um, I'll call it object and then it's like, I'll just put object here and then, you know, put 
QS there and JSON there, right? Like that's just not how the language works. So then you think, oh, okay, well, what do I have to do? Maybe I have to make some kind of if statement. So, and this is, this is I'm just kind of mimicking how someone might go about this. So then you think, well, all right, well, if, um, if the method is get or the method is delete, then the, um, let's call it the payload, is going to be um, QS data. But if the method is not those, if it's like put or post, then uh, the payload is going to be like QS, uh, sorry, JSON data, like that. Now this will work because now you can go and replace this here with like payload and you, you've, you've kind of made the, the function more dynamic. Um, and I, I know I shouldn't do that there technically, I guess. There's a few different ways you could write this, but maybe we could write it like that, where we just assume that it's JSON unless someone actually gives us a get or a delete. Um, I don't know why that's complaining. Okay, see, TypeScript's very smart. TypeScript here is like, how in the hell could that ever be delete, Hayden? You told me that it's only get and post. So now I have to go and, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll pull this up and I'll say, you know, type uh, method equals get or post or delete or put, you know, kind of clean up the code a little bit. And then I say, well, the method is, you know, of type method. Okay. So now this code starts to work and here, down here, you don't need that QS or JSON, but there was this great question by Sophia yesterday around like, should we use higher order functions everywhere? And it's like, is that really simpler? You know, like maybe. I, we could get into a conversation about it, but it's like, I don't think it's as clear cut as like, yes. You know, sure, you had a bit of repeated code before, but like that repeated code was really easy to read. You know, it was like request, you know, convert it. Now we've got this like gobbledygook thing up here, which is like payloads and gets and deletes. And like, you really have to stop and think about it. And at the end of the day, what you were repeating, you weren't repeating it 10 or 20 times, you were repeating the function like once or twice, and it was right next to each other in the code. You know what I mean? Like someone's not gonna miss both of them. So there's a lot of very interesting questions about you know, how far you should take some of these things. Or, and this is where we kind of get into that over-engineered category of writing code, where it's like, oh, you know, we're always trying to make everything super sleek all the time. And sometimes we can like take it too far. I'm not saying this is too far. I don't know, sincerely. If someone did this, I'd be like, like if I had an employee that did this, I'd be like, why'd you do that? Let's keep it, but like, I don't know why you did it. You know, seems like a waste of five minutes for what wasn't really a problem maybe. Um, but maybe that's not true. Maybe this function gets more complicated. Like this is all well and good for me to say, but that's because the reference point that this conversation started from was two relatively simple functions. Right? It, it was... Oops. Oh, that's, I think I can just delete this now. It was two relatively simple functions here. And, and so this is probably an unnecessary overcomplication of this, but um, what happens when these functions get more complicated? All functions get more complicated over time too. You might have error checking and a bunch of other stuff and more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. So maybe then it's the right idea. Or maybe you could keep it even simpler for now and just say like, we'll make a helper function called like, um, you know, uh, body string to object. And all this function does is it takes in um, a response object. Who knows what that object is? We'll come back to that later. You know, it's a, it's a really good practice with TypeScript, like any things, and you can just come back to them later. And we're just gonna essentially copy and paste this in here. So it just returns, you know, that. Except again, you know, if you want to, because it's a one line function, you could simplify this down. It's a bit of a long line. I think it's okay getting a little bit long. But now we can, you know, just say like body string to object of response. And now suddenly like you don't feel as much pressure. I mean, you could just return this as it is, you know. Um, that's, that's all you'd really have to do here. So there are lots of ways to improve it without anything, like without anything crazy there. Um, yeah. But you know, this, this is only kind of hard to abstract because of this weird object thing. Um, but that's, that was just a little bit of a fun rabbit hole together. Uh, we've got here, oh, let me see if there's any questions that have come up. 
Um, great. So iteration two starts next week. You're not going to be thinking about this right now. Um, I doubt any groups are so ahead of, well, there might be one or two groups that are just so on top of it, they're just super pumped for Monday or something. But um, carve out a tiny part of your brain just to reflect on it. Iteration two is taking iteration one, turning it into an HTTP server with TypeScript and doing a bit more, right? Iteration three, we just kind of do more. There's no big changes, but iteration one to two is a fairly big jump. And all it really does is touches on TypeScript, linting and HTTP servers, that's it. Um, so when it comes to iteration two, it's not really like a rewrite. You don't have to go and rewrite your entire code to work with HTTP servers. You're really just kind of wrapping it in something. Um, and what I mean by that is that, and this is without kind of getting too explicit into the code, you know that right now you have a function called um, login, auth login. And it takes in, and it's, it's, let's pretend it's a post request. It takes in a username and an email. Well, if you're starting iteration two, so this is that little nugget, just create a memory here, or you can just watch it later, is that when it comes to iteration two, you can simply say, you don't have to go and rewrite everything. You can actually just come and say, well, there's an auth login route, and I know that it's going to um, take in an email, and I know that it's going to take in a password. Right? And I'm going to capture that from the body that's going to be sent. And then all I'm going to do is simply return. I mean, what does it even return? It doesn't even return anything. Oh, it returns a token, right? So let's, this isn't the exact code, but it's like, let's imagine that it simply returns a token. And you've already written the function iteration one. So all you need to do is call auth login v1 or something like this with the email and the password. You know what I mean? Like you can leverage the work you've done because the actual code and the, the logic is done. You're actually just kind of converting this into like a little bit of a server environment. So um, there will be more routes to implement for iteration two that you don't have right now. Um, but the ones you've already written, it's a, it's a fairly just methodical, very quick process of just wrapping them in something to make them work on a web server. So you can actually, you can actually communicate with this little thing you're writing right now, but you know, through, through Express, through an API client. Uh, which is really fun. So point is, don't stress out about that. Um, and this is what I'm just referring to here. It's easy to just wrap your functions because most of the server stuff is just routing for functions you've already done. Um, a last little nugget before the end here is, and I think we actually will push this for, oh, I don't know. This is written somewhere. Um, I just wouldn't know right off the top of my head. But there's a really cool... Uh, Dependency, module, library, whatever, called Nodemon, um, which you can go on NPM install. Like you can just open up your project and you can just NPM install it. That's not what it is. NPM install, save, dev, Nodemon. And what you can do with this is that um, when you start the server, like w how we were starting the server before was we were running the file manually, right? We were running it with like TS node. Um, if you run it instead with Nodemon, it will actually set up this cute little environment for you, which will, what, what it does, and there's, there's uh, applications like this and, and for lots of these web servers in different languages, is what it does is it, it runs your web server but it also runs this thing alongside your web server that actually watches your file system on the computer in the folder and all the subfolders that your web server's in. And it watches that listening for a file change to ever happen. And a file change happens when you save a file. And every time you save a file, therefore what it does is it actually detects that and it says, oh, Hayden has gone and updated one of the files that the server's using. Um, I am now going to go and restart the server for him. Which makes, which makes the, the development aspect much easier. So before I was running it like this, I hope I haven't screwed it up because the configure, we, have, we spent some time configuring this for you correctly. Um, seems to work, right? Instead of running TS node, I just ran nodemon. It's that easy, you just change that text. You can see what's really interesting is that now when I save this and I hit like save, restarting due to changes, 
and it's crashing because I wrote a bunch of crap that won't work, right? But if I like undid that, you can see here, it'll restart. And if I change this from, you know, orange one to two exclamation marks, I can, you'll see this if I say, oh, oh it's the wrong thing. If I run the test, the test should still work that we wrote before, I hope. Okay, you'll see that if I just go and add a few exclamation marks here and click save, Nodemon will detect that, rerun it, and now the test will fail, right? Because the, t the code is not going to pass. What? Did I not test that? I don't know. Why did that, why did that succeed? I'm running a different file or something? I've got two post oranges. Well, there you go, that's interesting. It looks like that Express just ignores it if you copy it. I think what's happening there is it's just totally ignoring that second route. I hope, let's try it out. I'll just refresh that. That'd be quite funny if that's what it was doing. This should fail. There you go, failed because you know, we, we, we changed the, the input, we changed the test, it's not passing the test anymore. So um, that's it. That's HTTP servers in a nutshell. Um, oh, and I guess the other thing, we, we haven't talked much about TypeScript, now it's probably a good time to do it because we're about to finish, is that the way Iteration 2 set up is that whilst you're using TypeScript, if you have the wrong types um, or you use any's, which are generally considered bad, TS node will run your code for you. We've set it up that way. As in, even if it knows you've done something wrong, it's, it's just going to ignore it. It's going to be like, as long as your code is physically capable of working, I will run it for you. And I will not get in your way. This is something we changed from last term. And it's really useful because, you know, it can be very stressful. You've got, you know, maybe, maybe some of you are doing a couple of other brutal courses at the same time you're doing, you know, 2521 and some other course. And you're very stressed and you're trying to get your head around this. And then there's this TypeScript thing and you feel like an idiot and just like it's all kind of happening. So you don't have to get too caught up in um, just like I did here with these any's. You just be like it's an any. And you, it will just run. You know, TypeScript doesn't need this information. It, it can just put its hand over its ears or its eyes and just roll with it. Um, but that's when you run it with TS node. But in your projects, um, TS node is just uh, the TypeScript runner. But there is that command that we didn't talk about much, which is TSC, and this is the TypeScript compiler. Um, and how it's set up in your project for iteration two is that when we run this, it will actually do like a deep dive check on your code. It will like make sure that it's type perfect. The good thing is you don't actually ever have to run this if you don't want to. You can just ignore this and not run this command. What this command exists for, as we've said, as I said kind of last week, is that for iteration three, you'll be get, there'll, be, there'll be this bonus mark section and if your project can run this command without any errors, we'll just give you all those bonus marks. But you can kind of ignore this. You can ignore it from day one forever. You can ignore it from day one until like week nine when your team gets around to it. You can do what you'll probably do, which is say we'll ignore it this week and we'll worry about it in two weeks and then in two weeks your life will be even more on fire and then you'll ignore it till week 10 and then you'll be like, we've run out of time. And then you'll be like, doesn't matter. We didn't need the bonus marks anyway because we're struggling or something like that, you know? Um, but the point is that it's kind of out of your way. It's like an optional thing. And I can't run this here because the way the lecture code's set up is it will actually try and type check all of the lecture code at once, which if I run this, you'll see all the errors you'll get. It's not saying there's necessarily errors with every file, um, but there's a lot of errors, right? And, and some of these, like, you can't kind of get around because some of them are tied to, like, the problem with like lecture code as well is that like a lot of lecture code is kind of stupid, you know, like they're little nuggets of code that don't make sense in any context and they, they don't lend themselves well towards these type checkers because the type checkers are just like, what is that? That doesn't make any sense. Um, I don't have a good example here, but like some of these, like some of these ones um, that don't even, some, like code that, like this, it's just like, what is this file? It's like, I don't get it. It doesn't seem to do anything. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's the point with TypeScript. I just wanted to reiterate is that whilst there are the file types that end in .ts and that we've talked about it, it's really not going to get in your way. And if it does get in your way, it's probably because your code's just not going to work. You know, like TypeScript will call you up if you're like, if you try and do something completely stupid, but it's like, it's, in those cases, you actually don't want it. You don't want to ignore it. 
you know, like, cause, and, and you see this if, if you try and do something here, like you just say like const A equals B, TypeScript's gonna be like, this is TypeScript here typically being like, what the hell is B? You know, like JavaScript will figure it out in runtime, typically too, it's all pre-runtime, it's very kind of complex what it will do, but this is actually type, like TS node probably won't even run this. It won't even try and run it if I try and run it. It'll be like, what in the world is that? So if I save that and then try and run this, it'll probably just not run. I don't know, maybe it'll try. Yeah, see it's, no, it tried. There you go. It actually even tried to run it for you. It didn't even care about that. It's just like, whatever, we'll give it a go. Um, so TS node's not going to get in your way, TypeScript's not going to get in your way, but if you want those extra marks, you can let it get in your way and use that as a challenge. I, I generally encourage every group, like we structured it that way so that you'd all try to get TypeScript working because honestly, um, like I have this, you know, the, the, company, the company that I'm involved with outside of uni, it's like we used to write like 2018, we had all of our code written in JavaScript. Very similar-esque things to this. Really kind of simple code. Um, express servers and everything else. And then at some point, like nine months in, a few years ago, we were like, let's just convert stuff to TypeScript. And like the amount of bugs in the code probably dropped by like 90% overnight without any jest testing. You know, just because there's so many random things that happen because you're just passing things that shouldn't exist into things that shouldn't take it or don't want to take it, or you don't know how to deal with it. One of the most common instances of things TypeScript's really good at figuring out is when you pass something into a function, for instance, that um, could be null. Like a good example is that, I'll give you a really simple example. Let's say you have a server here, and you're like, ah, name. Okay, I get the name. And then you've got a function up here that's like format name. And you're like, ah, oh, it's, it's gonna take it in as a string, like this. You know, and then it's gonna return something, you know, the, the name. Um, and then if I call that, I'm not saying it'll pick up on it here um, necessarily, but maybe, oh, yeah. No, it's that annoying thing again. Uh, this isn't, this is an ad hoc example, but quite often when you pull something from that, the actual type you'll get will be this one. It'll be string or undefined. Because at compile time, it doesn't know if that's gonna be, a, it doesn't know if name exists, you know what I mean? Like it's at the mercy of like, if the person even passes it in at runtime, maybe they just won't pass it in. So the type of it formally is like, this could be a string or it could be nothing. And therefore, I'm not saying in this case specifically, but sometimes TypeScript will be like, yo, you're passing that into a function that expects that it's a string all the time. There's clearly an edge case there that might not be being dealt with. So then what it encourages you to do is maybe come in here and be like, well, you know, if string is undefined, um, you know, then maybe we will return undefined. Or maybe we'll return null. Or maybe we'll return an empty string. Or maybe we'll return a different string. So that's, that's like the ways that type checking is very powerful. Because it'll just pick up on all these things in a static sense that may lead to bugs in the future. And to be honest with you, fixing problems at a type level is so much easier than writing. I mean, who's been writing Jest for labs? You love it, don't you? Right? You're having a great time writing out all these test cases. I'm sure it's like putting a screwdriver through your eyeballs sometimes, you know? So it's like, it's much, much easier to pick things up at compile time, type checking, et cetera. That's pretty much all we have tonight. So we'll wrap up there. I'll just see if there's any questions here. There's not. Um, are there any questions here before we finish up? Okay, is it raining? Is it raining bad? Yeah. How bad? Oh, oh, it's a good time to break home. Okay.